together. If you're here in person, catching us out online, or if you're in the theater, we are so glad to be worshiping together as one church. Will you please stand and let's sing and worship our creed. loves us so much and uh, I hope that you feel that. I hope you're reminded of that or you experience that as you spend time with us. Hey, we got a couple more songs, but I just wanted to pause say my name's Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Oak Ridge. We are so glad that you're here with us. I love to see the room filled up each and every week because there's something powerful that happens when we're here together. Amen. Hey, if this is your first time with us, I hope it's the first of many. And if you're back for a second visit, then welcome back. We're glad you decided to come back. You know, we're a church with three venues, our auditorium venue where we are now, which is kind of a concert worship experience. Then off our West lobby, we have our theater venue, which is a smaller room like this, with more of a chill worship experience. And then we've got Oak Ridge Online. What's up, Oak Ridge Online? We love you guys. Yeah, let's give it up. 
So glad that you're joining us through the lens each and every week. Hey, let me know in the comments how long you've made Oak Ridge Online your home. I know our chat host would love to connect with you. We're so grateful for you that we get to be in community together online each and every week. Well, look, we got a couple more songs, like I said, and you know, these next songs are just a continual reminder of God and who he is and how much he loves us. And here's the thing, and that's what we're talking about in this next series is that, you know, the better we understand how much God loves us, the better we'll be. So I hope you'll continue to sing and worship with us.
Hey, before we're seated, I, I want to just pause for a minute and have a moment, a time of prayer, if that's okay. You know, many of you, like me, have probably seen the devastation that's been happening in parts of Maui due to the fire. I mean, it, it, you look at it, it's, it's almost like a war zone. People are, have lost their lives. They've lost their homes. They've lost family members. They're homeless. They have nothing. And, you know, I just can't imagine what they're going through. And, and you know, for us, it can be easy, I know it is for me, it can be easy to see that and just go on about our busy days and our busy schedules. And, and you know, here's the thing, we're, we're called as a people of faith to pray for others, you know, and, and this is the power of prayer that no matter where we are, we can pray for other people. So I just wanna pause and, and if you'll join me and we pray, and we should continue to do this because I mean, it's bad, right? And uh, so we wanna continue to pray as well, but let's join in and have a time of prayer together as a church and online. I hope you'll join in with us as well. 
Lord God, we just come to you, you know, knowing that you know perfectly well what's going on in Maui and the, the parts of the island there that have been devastated by this fire. You're not surprised by it. Lord, we thank you that in your grace and your mercy that, that, that you kept more people safe, that you helped people get out so there wouldn't be even more loss of life. But, but Lord, I just can't imagine what the families are going through that have lost family members, and the pain that that is causing for them today, that they've lost homes, they've lost everything. I heard of a man that had been in the same place for 40 years. Everything's gone, Lord. So we just pray, Lord, and I know already now you're sending Christians there, that people are already living there that are bringing hope and that are bringing healing, that are bringing supplies. So we just agree with those Christians now, right now that are praying for Maui, Lord God, all across the world. And we trust that you work it out, Lord God, that you'll bring peace, that you'll bring hope, that you'll bring healing, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you for us doing that together. You know, that's the power of prayer. That's something that we can do when we feel like, what do I do? Like we can always do that. We should do that for one another and we should do that for other brothers and sisters and people across the world that are hurting. Well, look, we're getting ready to jump into part two of our series, Better, with our lead pastor, Brian Moss. You know, we've been talking about, uh, you know, what does it look like to, you know, maybe be better God's way? Like maybe we have a thing that we think, you know, who doesn't want to be better? We all want to be better, but maybe God's plan of better is a little better than our plan. Can I say better one more time? Look at somebody and say better. Okay. <laughs> so you want to go ahead and grab your notes. You know, you can grab the, the ones you got when you came in as you walked in here in person, or if, if you're online or you want to follow along your phone, got two easy ways for you to be able to do that, you can text Oak Ridge to 94,000 and we'll send a link to your phone right now. Or you can go to the Oak Ridge app because the app is hit the live button and you'll see your message notes there. Hey, look, along with your message notes is your connect card. This is where you can take a next step. Maybe, maybe you've been coming and listening to this Jesus thing and been coming to Oak Ridge for a little while and maybe it's your turn to make a step of faith by making Jesus your uh, savior for the very first time. You could check that on there because I could send you some information on what that means. Maybe you're ready to get baptized. You've given your life to Jesus. You haven't done that yet. Or, or maybe you've been coming for a while and, and like you're sitting on the sidelines wondering like, what can I do? Like, what's my next step to get involved? Maybe Maybe it's time to find your place to serve. We've got lots of opportunities for you to be able to, to serve and use your gifts here to be part of what God is doing here. But, but make sure you take your next step because your life will never be the same if you do. And we believe everyone has a next step toward Jesus. It's also where you can let me know how I can pray for you. Like I'd be honored to pray whatever you have going on or maybe there's some kind of praise report you wanna give that God has answered a prayer. I'd love to hear that as well. Let me know, type that in, write that in. And then sometime before the end of the service, also give me some feedback under how do we do. Like what did you think? think about your experience here at Oak Ridge? Did you like the music? What'd you think about the message? Did you feel welcome, you know, from the parking lot in? What was your kids' experience like? We would love to hear about that, especially if you're a first or second time guest. And you'll be able to turn those connect cards in or send those in a little later in the service. Well, look, Brian's about to come out with part two of Better, so let's get ready by watching this video. Good morning. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up in a family that went to church frequently. And so when I came to know Christ at the age of 14, uh, I was watching an evangelist that was on television and heard him as he described what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, for me. 
to forgive us of our sins. And I, I made a decision that day in my home. I went into my bedroom. I knelt down on my knees and I gave my life to Jesus Christ for the very first time. And when I got saved, it was a radical transformation. It was life altering. It was very emotional, very dramatic for me. I recognized that, that really Jesus did forgive me for all of my past. And so I was so excited. I wanted to share the news with somebody. And the first person that came to my mind, because nobody was home, the first person that came to my mind was uh, a second mom. Did anybody here, did you have a second mom? Anybody have one of those second moms? And, and so I, I wanted to share with my second mom. So I got on the phone and I phoned her up and I, I said, uh, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And I shared with her how I had heard the message of Jesus. I had given my life to Christ. And uh, after a kind of a, a long pause, instead of, uh, instead of hearing a lot of congratulations, uh, the first thing she asked me was this, but were you slain in the spirit? Now, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so I had no idea what in the world she was talking about. I said, I don't know. <laughs> and, and so she, she said, oh, 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 well, uh, and she proceeded to begin to explain to me uh, from her Christian roots uh, what, what she thought would be an actual spiritual experience. And to be honest, by the time I hung up the phone, I had moved from on fire to Christ com to completely just befuddled, confused, uh, discouraged. I had no idea what she was talking about because I had no idea what the Bible said about any of that. And so I, I just walked away from it completely messed up. And listen, that would begin really my journey of discovering that many of the tacks that we receive in our Christian journey come from insiders not just outsiders. And often we like to look at, you know, the outside world and how they come against Christianity. But the truth is, there's an awful lot of things that can be thrown at you during your walk with Christ that can really mess you up in the journey that really comes in Christian clothes. And so we're going to talk about that as we dive into the second chapter of the book of Colossians, where Paul really kind of dives into that area for us. Now, last week, uh, Pastor Brian Lloyd got us started in chapter one, and he said this statement. He said, understanding who Jesus is makes us better. In other words, when you fully grasp all that Jesus fully is, it, it transforms us. And so he challenged us to begin to, to take steps towards that. I hope you were able to grab and download and check out the Colossians Bible reading plan and have started in that. It's a powerful step-by-step, verse-by-verse analysis of this, frankly, one of the most uh, deep letters that Paul wrote that deals with some pretty strong theology and, and helping us to comprehend not only who Jesus is, but then what does that mean to us? How does that impact who we are and how does it intersect with our walk with Christ? So today I'm going to try to cover all of Colossians chapter 2 in one setting. And so it starts out with this. He says, guys, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who frankly have never met me personally. Paul had never met the people that he was writing to. He said, in fact, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which in fact is Christ himself. You see, in him lie, all, lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I'm, I'm telling you this so that no one will, what? deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are in fact living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him, letting your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught. And then you will overflow with thankfulness. So he starts this off and it's almost like a parent. And he says, I'm agonizing. Any of you parents, just out of curiosity, any of you ever lost sleep because of your kids? <laughs> How many of you, you have grown children and you still lose sleep 
You're like, it still happens. So he starts out and he says, I'm agonizing. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying, there's something inside of me that is so concerned like a parent feels. Now, what is it that causes a pastor to lose sleep? Well, it's concern and worry about the condition of the sheep. A, a pastor is worried about that. In these first seven verses, Paul lists out a whole litany of things that he says, I really truly want for you. In case you missed it, let me go in fast pace order. He said, what I truly want for every believer. And by the way, this is my heart for you. He says, I want you to be encouraged, united in love, confident, wise, fully understanding who Jesus is, unshaken by lies, scams, and conspiracies, living in full intentionality, strong in your faith, upward in your journey, consistent in your commitment, rooted in in Jesus, grounded in truth and overflowing with gratitude. So he lists 13 attributes. He says, I want every believer to experience. Now, here's the truth. Satan has a twofold plan for your life and for every person on the planet. Stage one is his plan for every human being ever born is to keep you from knowing Christ. That's the very first thing that he wants for every person on the planet. He does not want anyone to come to know their faith in Jesus Christ. But if he misses that one, if he misses that objective, he doesn't just give up and walk away. His second objective is for every believer to keep you from growing in Christ. His passion is to do whatever it takes to keep you away from what helps you to grow in your faith. Now, what, is he, what does he use to do that? How does Satan keep most believers from growing their faith? Well, he has a whole set of tricks in his tool bag. But Paul mentions in these next two verses, he, he mentions several of them. He says, guys, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that frankly come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Everything God is, Jesus was. He says, so you also are complete in your union with Christ, who is the head of every ruler and authority. He's saying, if you got Jesus, you got it all. So Paul mentions in, this, in these couple of verses, three enemies and three elements that are used. First, he mentions, you know, he talks about the toxin, the target, and the, the trick. What's the toxin? False teaching. He said, I don't want anyone to capture you with these false teachings which he mentions are as empty philosophies. Any of you familiar with empty calories? <laughs> the empty calories is a, eating a bunch of stuff that absolutely does nothing nutritionally. Man, it looks good, it tastes good, it feels good, but it ain't good. Hello? And he says, man, there's a lot of teaching out there, Paul says, it's just empty teaching. It's not, it's not anything that, that will actually help you to grow in your brain. But man, are we attracted to it. Man, do we love that sugary stuff. Man, do we love to jump in all in on these false teachings. And then he says, the target of the enemy through the teaching is your mind. He wants to mess up what's happening inside your head. And he uses this phrase. He says, they're meant to capture you. And the word that Paul uses, which we don't see a lot of today in the United States, in fact, very few places in the world will you see this, perhaps in Ukraine or in Russia, and particularly on a Western front. The word capture here literally means to be carried out as a spoil of war. And he's saying, I don't want anybody to capture you and pull you. So that means there is a warfare that's happening and the desire is to capture you. And the target is your mind. You see, to the enemy, you're nothing more than a trophy of his treachery. And his passionate desire is to mess you up. And the trick that he's been using since the garden is to use your own pride and paranoia and even your own passivity 
because he knows that there are fatal flaws built into who we are that will mess us up, that entices us towards these teachings. It intrigues us. It draws us. That's why in verse 4 he said, I don't want anyone to deceive you with well-crafted arguments. That's exactly what happened to Eve. In the garden, Adam and Eve, what was the lie? The lie wasn't, man, this stuff tastes good. That's not what he said. The lie was, hey, God is holding out on you. There is secret stuff that God doesn't want you to know that will elevate you to a new level of spiritual maturity, growth, and control. If you Listen, God's holding out. And that's what false teaching always does. It creates a suspicion inside of your soul to go, wait a minute, it's the stuff the preacher didn't tell me. You can tell any cultist or any false teacher because they always start out like this. There's stuff the church didn't want you to know. Tune in and you'll find out juicy secrets that everyone's been holding out on you. It's all this sense. And inside of us, man, we love that stuff. We're like, really? Ooh. How many of us know that during uh, COVID-19, there were one or two uh, uh, conspiracies passing around all over the internet? Just, just a couple, just a couple. I mean, it was like a feast. All we had to do, we had nothing else to do but sit at home and read this garbage, right? So we were constantly like, I don't know anymore. Most people just got so confused, they just got despondent, and it messed us up emotionally. Would you agree with that? It messed us up. I can't wait for the emails after this message, people. That... <laughs> but no, it's really true, Pastor Brian. <laughs> there were microchips and all them vaccines and da 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 I mean... You can, by the way, save yourself the time, okay? <laughs> Here's what he says. He says, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that you're turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. In fact, now you're following a different way that pretends to be good news, the gospel, but it's really not the gospel at all. How? Because you're being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. So he's saying there are people in the church who just get off on this idea of messing with your mind. You see, dear friend, you may not realize it, but one of the greatest dangers to your spiritual health, it's not at some evil deed, but an evil doctrine. And I've seen Christians over the decades that have been completely taken out of church, completely taken away from following Christ because of some idiotic, toxic teaching. And they bit into it and it poisoned their soul. So I want to talk about three toxic teachings that Paul lists in this passage that will absolutely tank your faith and it's been working for 2,000 years. You know, uh, just in the last year, over 87,000 Americans died due to poisoning. And I think almost as many Christians succumb to poison doctrine. So what are these three? Wow. In fact, do you feel enlightened? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> All three. Everybody online, everything's going, what's he talking about? Okay. <laughs> All three toxins have this in common. Jesus is not enough. So all three of these and every false teaching and cult is built on twisting who Jesus is and what Jesus did. So what are the three that Paul lists? First is Jesus plus rules, which is legalism. When you add a rule set, you're like, oh, Jesus, yeah, but let's add some stuff to that, some rules. Look what he said, verse 16 and 17, he says, don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or what you drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these what? Rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is the reality. When, uh, when Lisa and I met, we met in a phenomenal church, powerful evangelistic church. It was a, it was a, a amazing evangelism. I mean, so many people were saved through that church. But there was also a subsection 
of that church. It was extremely clear that there was a group of people who were kind of in their own sect. What it had to do with was a guy by the name of Bill Gothard. Bill Gothard was a Bible teacher who would come through Tulsa, Oklahoma once a year, rent the Civic Center, and tens of thousands of Christians. In case you, in case you don't know, now Bible Belt, everybody would know Gothard the moment I say it. Over here on the East Coast, I go, huh? And so uh, Bill Gothard was basically, uh, if, you, if you've ever heard of the Duggars, you ever heard of the Duggars? Yeah, so that's that same connection, that same kind of mentality. So he would come through, and every year, tens of thousands of Christians from Tulsa, they would pack this arena for days. I mean, it would go five, six, seven days, every night, three hours, teaching, 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 teaching. And here's what I saw. Now, there was a lot of you go, huh, that's interesting. There was a lot of stuff you go, well, that, mm, I don't know, maybe. Lots of stories woven in. But, but then every once in a while in the story, you would hear something you kind of go, ah, I don't know. And woven into the narrative was tons of rules. Now, some of the rules include things like there's certain clothes you can and cannot wear. There's, there's, there's certain ways and times that you can and cannot have sex. There are certain birth control measures you can and cannot do. And by the way, it would be given in graphic detail of the things that you can do. Well, I remember one night, he went on for one hour describing the kinds of musical notes which were satanic and musical notes which were from heaven. There were ways that you could use a microphone microphone that were godly and a way that a microphone could be used that was ungodly. It got bizarre where you kind of go, wow. But the worst of it was the number of people within our church that began to, re go, they regressed in their Christianity back to a point of truly believing that they must atone for their own sin. And this unbelievable sense of, man, yeah, Christ gave me a, a hall pass, but I got to go fix all the rest of my past. The result was a joyless Christianity filled with rules and regulations that immediately create a watchful eye between believers of who's doing it right and who is doing it wrong. You see, legalism is a rules-based spirituality. It's very clear that what the rules are, and if you're not following them, you must not love God as much as we do. Legalism is, legalism is the very essence of every religion on the entire planet except Christianity. I love what A.W. Tozer wrote. He said, it was, remember folks, it was religion that put Jesus on the cross. Paul mentions two rules in this passage that the infiltrators were promoting, specifically diets and days. Diets and days. So he says, he says it's, it, it, that there are certain things that you have to eat, and they're saying if you, don't, if you eat this or you don't eat that. And, and, listen, guys, Jesus dropped the mic in his ministry when in public he said in front of the Pharisees, Guys, it is not what goes into the body that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes out of your heart. Now listen, that might not be a big thing for you and I, but in the middle of a bunch of Orthodox Jews, you just told them that all of their kosher laws is nonsense. They probably should have stoned them right then and killed him because he's basically saying the righteousness that you've worked so hard it doesn't count for anything it's about a heart issue food isn't the problem with your purity your heart is the heart of the matter and they didn't want to hear that Second, he dealt with a certain days. You know, Paul said that, that you have to observe these days and new moons and certain days are holy and other days. And, and, and Paul says, no. In fact, he deals with this, uh, this mindset in Romans just as he does here. He says, guys, in the same way, there are people who think that one day is more holy than another day. While others think that every day is just alike. You, every one of you should be fully convinced that whatever day you choose... For your day of worship is acceptable. Now that messes with some people. There are whole denominations based on Sabbath keeping Christianity. So, so sometimes people say, well, why don't we 
celebrate this. Why don't we do the Sabbath? Why aren't we keeping the Sabbath? Well, let me list you a couple of reasons very quickly. You can put it in the notes if you want to. Here it is. That it, the Sabbath was given to the nation of Israel as a sign of a covenant. It's called the Old Covenant. How many of us know that when Jesus came, he instituted a new covenant? That's why we call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the Sabbath keeping was part of the Old Covenant. Second, because when Gentiles first started getting saved, they had to have a council in Jerusalem with the top leaders and they said, wait a minute, stop everything. We didn't know that Gentiles could be saved in the first place, but since they are, they better follow the rules. And in, in, in Acts, they, they formed a council. In Acts 15, they said, well, let's talk about it. And the council met together and said, no, they don't need to follow the rules. Just tell them, don't eat food that was given to an idol. Don't eat blood. And don't commit sexual sin. But everything else, you're fine. Because Jesus is enough. So he, he had the moment to tell them, you know, and by the way, be sure you keep the Sabbath. But we didn't do that. You see, we translated in modern Christianity all about a day of worship. But that's not true of the Jews. It was primarily a day of resting from work. Primarily it was a ceasing of your work. Not just when to worship. Now, did they worship? Yes, but it was primarily the Sabbath. The word itself means to rest. So, so listen, Jewish Christians chose to worship on the Sunday and move it to that day because they were celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it was completely different. So we don't celebrate the, the, the Sabbath in the same way as a Jew. That was a part of the old covenant. Now, in fact, Paul said it this way. He said, all of these rules were just shadows of a reality yet to come. Now, that word shadow means that it was looking forward to the future that God in the Old Testament was giving us specific things that would point us as markers so that we would clearly know so, for example, when the Passover occurred and they had to take a lamb and they spread the blood over the lintel of the doorposts and, and made the sign of the cross so that the angel of death would pass over, it was a foreshadowing that Jesus would be the perfect lamb of God sent for the forgiveness of our sins. So that when, it was no mistake that when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, was literally the day of first fruits. First fruits was when you were going to celebrate your harvest, and before you, you reap all of the harvest, you would cut off just the corners and bring them as a celebration, as offering to God and say, God, because of the great harvest you are about to give us, we offer back to you. Thanks for all that you are bringing to us. It was a sign because 3,000 people were brought to faith in Christ on that very first Pentecost day, but it was just a sign of the harvest that was ahead. And even the Sabbath when it was given, the Sabbath was a time when they rested from all of their works, and yet Jesus, Hebrews tells us, is that final rest because now his work is finished on the cross, and there's nothing you can add to that. So none of your works will achieve what Jesus has already done. Get it? <laughs> Some of you are going, Whoo. it's getting heavy up in here. He says in Romans chapter 10, he says, brothers, sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. So Paul is saying, listen, I deeply desire for these passionate legalists to come to know Christ. You see, I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way. They cling to their own way of getting right with God. How? By trying to keep the law. They're still trying to follow the rules to make it into heaven. But Paul is clearly saying, listen, true righteousness is something to be received, not achieved. True righteousness is something that you can only receive, not something that you can achieve. Jesus plus some rules equals legalism. 
The second toxin that he deals with is Jesus plus knowledge is mysticism. And he deals secondly with this idea of mysticism. Verse 18 and 19 says, don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or worship of angels saying they had these visions about things. Their sinful minds have made them proud and believe me, they're not connected to Christ who's the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments and it grows as God nourishes it. I remember as an engineer, I was working at one of the sites that we were sent to and I started talking to this other guy. I discovered he was a Christian too and I was like, man, this is awesome. Now I know another believer here at work and we can really have fellowship and talk. And uh, he started talking to me and he said, hey, let me know. He says, uh, he says since you became a Christian, have you received the second baptism of the Holy Ghost? I said, absolutely, because I, I, all of Jesus means all of God. He says, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Have you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost as is evidenced by the speaking of other languages and tongues inspired by the Holy Spirit? Have you done that? I said, well, no. Oh, brother, brother, brother. Let me explain it to you like this. You see, you and I, we both have insurance. And when you come to Christ, you, 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 get, the, you get liability. You're safe from hell. But when you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, some reason when it's super spiritual, it's ghost, he's not spirit anymore. You got the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in tongues. When you get that, you got full coverage. Now you got the next package. You're at the next level. And that, dear friend, is mysticism in a nutshell. It's pretending that somehow there's some revelation that is beyond, that will make you more spiritual. And that's what mysticism fundamentally is. It's a revelation-based spirituality. Mysticism overemphasizes the spiritual realm, pointing towards supernatural secrets and wonders and signs and, and measures your level of spiritual maturity based on goosebumps. Like, the greater the goosebumps, the bigger you have in your spiritual depth and your spiritual walk. Now, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm writing right now a, a, a church history overview course that'll add on to the Bible overview course. And there's a guy, this stuff started very early in Christianity. There's a guy by the main, name of Montanus. He was already in the early second century, he began having these manifestations. And then he would begin having prophecies. And he would begin teaching everyone in his congregation that, that they had to speak in tongues, that it was a two-tier Christianity. It was, it, Every marker he had. In fact, he began also to move into end times. It seemed like all of his teaching always focused on end times theology and all the signs and, what, and all the things that were going to happen to end times and preparing his believers for the end times. And eventually, he was excommunicated from the church. Eventually, he just crossed the line where the church leader said, you just cannot keep going there because he kept predicting things that didn't happen. By the way, in the Old Testament, the, the standard of that is if, you, if a prophet prophesies in the name of the Lord and it doesn't come true, you kill him. It's a pretty simple test, right? So we should probably be a little more careful before we drop those bombs out there. And, and so this is not new to Christianity, this idea of two-tier Christianity. In fact, there's two dangers we fall into with mystical Christianity. Here's the first one. We develop experience junkies. We develop experience junkies. People who literally become addicted to the emotional or the visceral. Now listen to me very carefully. What this produces inside of you, dear, dear Christian, it produces inside of you this sense that you're looking for Jesus, but he's somewhere out there. This past February, a revival broke out on the campus of Asbury. With, within just two days, over 50,000 people descended on a little town not even capable of supporting more than 5,000 people, descended on this town in the droves 
looking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, desperately hoping that they would catch part of the wave. Now, now, now listen, some of you have asked me, well, Pastor Brian, was it real? I don't know, but here's what I do know. Can I tell you two things I know without a shadow of a doubt? If you treat the Holy Spirit like a hit of heroin, you'll always be looking for that next high. That's not how the Holy Spirit is described in the New Testament. And second, it develops a sense that you'll always feel like God isn't really with me. I got to go find him somewhere else. I'm constantly seeking an experience because once the feelings fade, so does my faith. Second danger is it creates a cult of charisma. A cult of charisma. Paul says, look, guys, I don't think I'm in any way less important than those super apostles. People like that, he says, are just false apostles. They work hard to trick other people. They only pretend to be apostles. So Paul, even in his day, is dealing with people who are showing up being charismatic celebrity Christians. Like all of a sudden, it's like, man, I'm the guy. I got all the power. Listen, the graveyard of super saints is littered with leaders. Names that we've all, names like Jim Baker and Bill Hybels and Jimmy Swaggart and Mark Driscoll and, and Perry Noble and, and Hillsong's recent Carl Lentz and Brian, it just goes on and on and on and on. Why? Because friend, if you place any spiritual leader, starting with Brian Moss, <laughs> If you place any spiritual leader in a seat that only Jesus can fill, you are taking in a toxin that is destined to kill your spiritual vitality. No human being can take the place of Jesus, nor should we ever. It's only Jesus. Jesus plus legalism, Jesus plus in mysticism, and Jesus plus self-denial, that's asceticism, asceticism. That's just a hard word to say. Would you agree with that? Look what he says next, verse 20 through 23. He says, for you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep following the rules of the world? Stuff like don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise, because they require strong devotion, pious, self-denial, severe bodily discipline. But in the end, they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desire. See, asceticism is restraint-based salvation and spiritual vitality. In other words, it thinks that somehow I'm going to become more spiritual by what I deny myself. In fact, it's reverse legalism. It's rules of denial, stuff that, it's not about your deeds, the stuff you do, it's about the denial, the stuff you choose not to do. So for the ascetic, it boils down to don't, don't, don't. <laughs> you can't do that. No sex, no alcohol, no worldly pleasure. That's how the monks, that's how the whole monastic movement was born. The whole monastic movement was born on people who said the only way to get closer to God and, and to Jesus is to get away from the world because pleasure, bad. <laughs> Misery, good. And that was the idea that somehow that I had to become really miserable. And the more I put away from myself, it was the old school hardline Baptist used to say, don't drink, don't chew, and don't go with girls to do. It was all about the stuff you just don't do, right? You cut it out and somehow, that's what, you know, when I came to Oak Ridge, they had a, a safe in the floor in the old building. And in that safe, there was actually a, a, their charter from 1962 when they started the church. There was a charter and on the very first page, the very first statement and requirement of membership was temperance. No alcohol ever on your lips, that was the very first, you couldn't be a member of the church. Most of you are now disqualified. <laughs> He's like, I'm out, all right? 
but that became elevated to this level. So, and that's actually what this idea is. Asceticism does that. Now, some people say, well, isn't it a good thing to kind of like, you know, what about fasting? I mean, that's like denying yourself, but asceticism goes beyond. It's another form of trying to purify the soul by punishing the body. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 22. He said, in the same way, on the outside, they appear very righteous, but at inside, they're filled with hypocrisy and wickedness. In other words, that stuff doesn't make you pure. So Paul is trying to warn the believers in Colossae, don't follow these toxic teachings. He said, well, then, Pastor Ron, why do so many Christians fall into these traps? Let me just tell you three reasons why. Because legalism... We like a scorecard. You know why the Bible app has been so popular? Because you like a scorecard. It's built into your human nature. I did it, I did it, I did it, I did it. Check, 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 check. It's just built into who we are. We like that. So we like to, but here's the problem. I can't measure my maturity by a scorecard. You can do all the checks and still be spiritually bankrupt. For, for mysticism, here's why we like mysticism. It's an easy pass. Friend, I wish I could tell you there was a quick dose of Holy Ghost that could make you all that you ever needed to be and you didn't have to struggle with sin nature ever again. Wouldn't that be great? The problem is it's not true. Now, we wish it was true. It's just not true. In fact, it's not even biblical. And then with asceticism, it's because you and I naturally don't feel worthy. And there's something inside of us that keeps saying, it can't be this easy. Surely, what all that Jesus did for me, I know I'm not worthy of that. And so we fall into the rut of trying to earn it. So boiling all this down, what does it all relate to? Hosea said it best. God said, my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. And here's what I know and I've learned as a pastor. The most vulnerable are always the least knowledgeable. The less you know of God's word, the more vulnerable you are. And Paul boils it all down and says, guys, Christ is the better way. Christ alone, not legalism, not mysticism, not asceticism, it is Christ. That's why he comes back to their faith and he says, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of our sinful nature for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to partial life, is that what it says? To new life, because you trusted in the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You see, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature that was not yet cut away. But God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And in this way, he disarmed all of the spiritual rulers and authorities and he shamed them publicly by his victory on the cross. Friend, only a fool would try to add to and improve the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's truly Jesus. You know, the Protestant reformers woke up in the 16th century and the church had become so corrupted with rules and regulations and what you could do and what you couldn't do and, and, all the th and paying for your sin. It was so corrupt that they finally said, enough! And they found that they had to replace relationship. They had to say, no more rules. We need a relationship with Jesus Christ. They replace faith with their feelings, Christ with the cardinals, the truth with their traditions, and the joy of following Jesus with a judgmental spirit of sin I can't get rid of. And so they said in that Protestant Reformation five statements that we are saved, sanctified, strengthened, and sustained by grace alone through 
faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed through his scripture alone and for the glory of God alone. That was the cry of the Protestant Reformation. And by the way, that's what birthed this church and every other Protestant church. So let me ask you this as we close. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, how's your joy factor? Or have you slipped into the subtle system of following the rules or seeking some experience or knowledge or secret? It's key to Christianity. Or maybe you came out of a religious background that is ingrained in your brain, this idea that you're not worthy and you got to do more and it's not enough just to have Jesus. You better follow the rules. Stuff you can't do, stuff you can do, you better base your faith on rules. So how's your joy factor? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you gave us your word that is so clear and helps us to bring us back to the centrality that not only is Christ supreme over all, he is enough. That Christ is the better way. That what he accomplished for us paid everything that we cannot add to that. And that today we ought to live lives that show gratitude living out a loving, humble faith that says, God, I want to live as your people, not to earn your grace, but to share it and show it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Pastor Brian. Isn't it funny how we make things harder than it needs to be sometimes? You know, I know I do. My diet, relationships, you know, we always make things harder. And I think that's the same thing that was happening then and can happen in our faith. And I'm so glad Pastor Brian helped clear that up for us and helped center us because Jesus is a better way. We don't need to add things to Jesus. He's already taken care of everything. So I want to give you a couple action steps to help you continue the conversation on for you and your family or, your, you know, whoever you're doing this life thing, Jesus thing with together. Maybe it's just you. And, and I want to give you some things, the resources that can help you do that. The first, as Pastor Brian says, the Colossians reading plan. You know, again, we want to continue. This lifelong journey is learning more about Jesus, having a better understanding so that we can be more like him and push away all these other things that are not like him. So check out this Colossians reading plan. It's so great. It's simple. A few verses each day and then some thoughts to think about. If you're new to the Bible, man, this is going to be so great for you. It's really going to just make the Bible come alive. And again, if you've been doing it like me for a while, it's still very, very rich. So let's do this together. The second Second thing is take second base. Second base is part of our growth track. Growth track is all about helping you know God and the plan that he has for your life. I teach second. It's about two things prayer and Bible reading. Like how do we pray so that we can be closer to God and communicating with God? And then how do we know him more and have a better understanding of him through his word? And how do we approach it? Sometimes, you know, do you ever feel like you open the Bible? Like, what do I do with this? Right? It says, leave my mother and father. I don't know what to do here. And mom and dad are like, yeah, shoot, you should do that. But anyway, um, no, 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 no. Anyway, this second is going to help you though, in your relationship with God through prayer and Bible reading. So check that out. You can sign up for all of this by uh, texting Oak Ridge to 94,000. We'll give you a link for the reading plan and a link to sign up for second, or you can go to the Oak Ridge app under next steps and you will see it there. Hey, we're going to move to the part of the service where we give to the mission of Oak Ridge, which is to bring hope and healing to hearts and homes. Thank you for being such a generous church. While you're getting ready for that, I want to share with you a connect card I got this week. And uh, I asked the, the young lady if I could share this. because I just thought this was so you know, just embodied why we are here and what we do. Check out this connect card. This is what she said. She says, thank you for being here today for me and letting me know I am not alone because I've felt very empty and I needed to feel whole again. You know, you just never know what's gonna happen when people come here and the fact that we're here, you know, cause people are lonely, you know, I, maybe you feel that way today, you know, and this place is a little bit of hope and healing for you. And you know, what you do, what you give, how you serve here makes a difference in people's lives. Like she felt that that day. So I just wanna thank you and let you know, like this is one of many, many, many stories that I get to hear that you play a part in, whether you know it or not. So thank you so much for that. 
We have three ways for you to be able to give. You can use our app. You can use the giving envelope under your seat or on your seat back or our website. And listen, if you're a first time guest, feel no pressure to give. If you want to give us anything, give me some feedback on your connect card and what your experience was like with us. We're going to send you this uh, envelope here in the mail. If you fill out your connect card, let me know your first time guest inside is some more information about us, plus a gift card to Island Creamery, our local you know, ice cream shop that you all already know I love so much. And uh, it's just our way of saying thank you for joining us. So make sure you fill out your connect card on online or here in person. Let me know your first time guest. We'll get you one of these. Let me take a moment and pray before we get out of here. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for the truth of your word that pushes against our own thinking, that pushes against culture's thinking and gives us a better understanding of you and who you are and what you want and what you did for us, Lord. Thank you. We don't have to wonder. And I pray that, Lord, as we hear all this information, Lord, that we'll take some steps to apply it in our lives, that we'll look at the Colossians reading plan that will take second base to kind of just bring this all down to where we live and applicable to our lives. Help us with that, Lord God, follow through with that. And Lord, for those that are given online or in person, thank you so much for their generosity. I hope you bless and keep them. And for that person that's given for the very first time, what a huge step of faith. Would you give them the peace that passes all understanding as your scripture says, in Jesus' name, amen.